Okay. Uh, so uh, this is one object uh, also of interest when speaking about uh, geometrically induced uh, discrete eigenvalues. Uh, so uh, these operators have been studied in many situations. There are many people here in the audience who were working also intensively on these kinds of operators, like, of course, Pavel, Yussi, uh, Konstantin Bangrashkin, uh, Andrea Brosolicano, also many other people who are not here. Uh, doesn't make any sense to name all of them because I miss some of them anyway. And um, this is observed in many situations that uh, some discrete eigenvalues are produced by the geometry of the uh, interaction support gamma. And I'm very much interested in the situation that gamma is a broken line. So what is a broken line? Let me do the definition with a picture. Broken line should be uh, consisting of two line segments that uh, meet at the origin and uh, assume that they have here half of an opening angle being uh, named by omega, and this should be e some angle between zero and pi over two. If we uh, reach the uh, border value pi over two, then it would be a straight line. This I do not want to have. For omega equal to zero, you would have just one line segment. All right. Uh, the Schrodinger operator with a delta potential uh, supported on such a broken line is uh, studied quite explicitly in the literature. And uh, I would like to mention two uh, results in this regard. There are actually many more. But one of the first one is by Pavel and a PhD student from that time, uh, Katrina Nemkova uh, from 2003, who were studying this model. And what they were realizing was that if the coefficient alpha of the delta potential is larger or equal than zero, then the uh, spectrum of the operator E alpha is just a non-negative real half line. So uh, it's just the same as the spectrum of the unperturbed Schrödinger operator. Nothing interesting is happening here. But for negative uh, values of the alpha, it turned out that first of all, the essential spectrum of the operator is shifted. It starts now from minus alpha squared over four and goes to plus infinity. So essential spectrum is shifted to the left. And what was also shown uh, by Exner and Niemkova is that um, if the opening angle or half of the opening angle omega is sufficiently small, then the discrete spectrum of A alpha is non-empty which means that by playing around with the geometry of the open line, uh, you can produce uh, discrete eigenvalues, which are then geometrically induced eigenvalues. Yes. This is what I wanted to say now. Uh, thanks. Uh, this was in 2003. Of course, the world didn't end and the study of these operators didn't end at that time. Much more was done in the uh, meantime. And what I would like to mention is one result by Constantine from 2017, where he was uh, giving a very nice uh, result uh, about these kinds of operators, or actually in a more general setting uh, with some variational proof. Uh, what he was uh, showing is that if you have some negative interaction strength and any angle from between zero and pi over two, then the discrete spectrum is also empty. So uh, as Pavel was already uh, pointing out, in this model with the uh, broken line, uh, as soon as the line is not a straight line, you always have some geometrically induced uh, discrete eigenvalues. As I said, there's actually done much more uh, asymptotic behavior when the broken line becomes a straight line, asymptotic behavior when the uh, line becomes a line segment don't want to say too much about that. I would like to come to another problem now, uh, motivated uh, by this uh, result about Schrödinger operators with delta potential. The question is now, can you do something similar for um, two-dimensional Dirac operators? With delta potential supported on such a broken line. And before going uh, more into details about these things, I should maybe say a few words about Dirac operators with two-dimensional uh, uh, two-dimensional Dirac operators with delta potentials, because probably not everyone is very much familiar with this. So, uh, what is the uh, formal um, 
thing of uh, the operator that I'm interested in. I'll write it down and discuss it then. So a Dirac operator is a two-dimensional Dirac operator is a two-by-two two matrix valued uh, partial differential operator of order one. Uh, so the matrices that are appearing here in its definition are exactly the Pauli spin matrices. For this part here in front where the uh, partial derivatives are involved, I'm going to use in the future this uh, shortcut uh, gradient uh, sigma times gradient, which means these two uh, Pauli matrices sigma one, sigma two times these uh, vector valued quantities when considering the gradient as a vector. Here we have uh, the Pauli matrix of sigma three. Uh, this M here is a, in a typical applications a mass term and I'm going to assume that it's a non-negative number. Uh, the tau, the coefficient of the uh, delta potential here uh, is assumed to be a um, real number. And uh, this uh, delta potential that I have here is uh, something that the physicists, uh, physicians are calling uh, Lorentz Kähler delta potential. Uh, why this complicated name? Uh, since you have here a matrix valued uh, differential operator, we can of course have uh, matrix valued uh, potentials as well. And if you're in the situation that you have a scalar valued function times this uh, Pauli matrix sigma three, then uh, this is called a Lorentz scalar potential. All right, um, such Dirac operators are coming into application uh, from mathematical physics because it's kind of the relativistic counterpart of uh, the Schrödinger operator, which means you can describe similar physical systems as a Schrödinger operator, but now also taking effects of the special theory of relativity into account. And um, if you are wondering now about um, geometrically induced spectral properties of such operators and what is known so far, then the answer is actually not too much. Uh, there are some results in asymptotic regimes if this coefficient m here is becoming very large or very uh, small, so if m goes to plus or minus infinity, then there are some results uh, relating uh, the spectrum of this operator here to some effective operator on the curve gamma where you can read off uh, some spectral properties. But the thing is, at least to the best of my knowledge, uh, for general uh, masses M here, uh, actually nothing is known about the geometrically induced discrete eigenvalues of such problems. And uh, this is the thing that uh, together with Vladimir and Dale, we uh, wanted to study. All right, uh, so of course, um, this is only a formal expression here. So uh, before now starting to discuss the uh, spectral properties of such models, I should give you first some uh, rigorous definition of the uh, corresponding operator as a differential operator in L2 and discuss um, the self jointness of the model. So um, in the following, uh, so from now on, I will become mathematically uh, precise. In the following, I am going to assume that the coefficient tau of my delta potential should not be equal to plus or minus two. So this I'm assuming for some technical reasons. And then uh, how can I define um, such an operator here? For this, I need some uh, geometric notations first. So if, if we have here now again our broken line gamma. Then I assume that uh, this uh, line gamma separates the R2 into a part omega plus and omega minus. And I'm going to denote by mu the normal vector which is pointing outwards of um, omega plus. And the symbol that I'm going to use quite frequently, if I have a function f that is defined on the full Euclidean space R2 and I restrict it to omega plus and minus, then I'm going to denote this by f plus minus. Okay, so how can I introduce now a differential operator in L2 corresponding to this expression? Uh, 
I'm going to uh, use for first definition letter S applied to a function S, F. This is defined as uh, the action in omega plus and omega minus, because if I constitute the action in omega plus and omega minus, I have it almost everywhere. And since the potential, uh, the delta potential is only acting on the curve uh, gamma, so to say, in omega plus and omega minus, it's acting like an unperturbed uh, Dirac operator. Plus minus i sigma times grad plus m sigma 3 f minus. So with this, we have the, uh, described the action of the operator almost everywhere. And in a similar way as we had it in the talk of Georg uh, in the morning, uh, the delta potential is hidden in the domain of definition of the operator, which consists of all those functions f, which have h1 smoothness away from the curve gamma, rc2 valued. Of course, uh, we have some matrix value differential expression, so it has to act on vector valued functions. And they additionally have to satisfy some jump conditions, namely that the trace of f plus at gamma is related to the trace of f minus at gamma by multiplication with some matrix M, which is given by, um, here it is, uh, 4 plus tau squared divided by 4 minus tau squared times the identity matrix minus uh, 4 tau divided by 4 minus tau squared times i times sigma times the normal vector. So here I use a similar notation as here with the differential expression, but now with the normal vector instead of the gradient. And here I was missing some uh, sigma 3 in between. Okay, so that's the domain of definition of our operator. Uh, and as I said, um, the cruel thing is that uh, the restrictions in omega plus and omega minus are related to each other by this uh, jump condition here at the um, curve gamma. And uh, if one considers this in the distributional sense, then, then you see that uh, this exactly corresponds to some uh, delta perturbation of the uh, operator. All right, um, and by the way, what you also see is uh, here you get some problem when you allow tau to be equal uh, plus or minus two. Here you would have some um, division by zero. For these two special values, one would have uh, separated boundary conditions actually and no transmission condition. All right, um, so what about now the uh, self adjointness of this uh, operator here? Uh, this is actually something that is already known. Uh, it was known uh, already to, uh, in a paper from Fabio Pizzichillo and Hanne van den Bosch and worked out then in much greater detail by Dale and uh, Vladimir. So Freimark and Lotto Rejic. And the thing is that this operator that I denoted here by S is not a self adjoint operator, but it's only a symmetric operator. So S is symmetric. It is closed. And the uh, defect numbers, so the dimension of the kernel of S star minus plus I, these two defect numbers are both equal to one which means that this operator that I defined here above with the help of these transmission conditions uh, has a family of uh, one, uh, a family of self adjoint extensions that can be parameterized by one real parameter. All right, so uh, the self adjointness of the operator is now quite well understood. As I said, this is actually something that was already well known before. And now the question was, what about the spectrum of these operators? And this was the main thing in the project uh, with uh, Dale and Vladimir. And here's the main result about the spectrum. So the thing is the following. Um, I assume here that the mass M should be strictly positive as otherwise uh, nothing interesting is happening. Um, tau should be a real number 
which should not be one of the two bad guys plus minus two. And I also want to include uh, zero because for tau being equal to zero, I just have the free unperturbed Dirac operator, which is well started. And I assume uh, that H is any self adjoint extension of our symmetric operator S. So independent of which uh, self adjoint extension I'm going to choose, the following is going to be true. And uh, similarly, as we had it for the Schrödinger operator with a delta potential, we need to distinguish now the sign of the interaction strength. And if tau is larger than zero, then the situation is again simple, because then the essential spectrum of H is equal, uh, it's consisting of two intervals from minus infinity to minus M and from plus M to plus infinity. This is exactly the essential spectrum of the free unperturbed Dirac operator. And there is at most one discrete eigenvalue of this operator H. Of course, if you have a uh, uh, one parametric family of self adjoint extensions, then you can always produce a model which has one discrete eigenvalue. So this is uh, nothing special. This is just coming from the abstract extension theory. Now more interesting things are happening if uh, the tau is negative. In this case, I set as a shortcut epsilon naught to be the following number. M times the absolute value of tau square minus four divided by tau square plus four. You see that this is a number that is certainly strictly smaller than uh, M. And with this thing, we can write the essential spectrum of our self adjoint realization as uh, two intervals from minus infinity to minus epsilon naught and from plus epsilon naught to plus infinity. So the essential spectrum is becoming again larger uh, for some negative value of the tau. And the second thing is, for all natural numbers capital N, there exists some angle omega, which is of course dependent on this number N and also on some other quantities between uh, zero and pi over two, such that the number of the discrete eigenvalues of our self adjoint realization is larger or equal than this uh, given number capital N. And now what do we see? Uh, the thing is, if we are closing now our broken line, if we're making the angle between the uh, two wedges smaller and smaller, then at some point uh, you will get discrete eigenvalues and the number of these discrete eigenvalues is becoming larger and larger. And this is really some uh, geometric effect now. So uh, with this model, we can really uh, show that there are some geometrically induced uh, discrete eigenvalues of uh, the Dirac operator with a delta potential supported on this uh, broken line. And as I mentioned, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first explicit construction where you really see uh, explicitly that you have some geometrically induced eigenvalues also for the Dirac operator um, with uh, the delta potential supported on this broken line. All right, uh, so I have, and yes, good point, thank you very much, uh, that I was forgetting. And this is a result which is true for any self adjoint extension. So not for a particular choice of the self adjoint extension of the original symmetric operator S, but this is true for any self adjoint extension of this operator. Of course, for a fixed angle um, for all extensions, the angle should be fixed for this consideration, of course. Yes, of course, but uh, uh, I mean, um, we have a one, uh, the uh, self adjoint extensions are parameterized by one parameter. So uh, the number of eigenvalues is just uh, different by one then finally. So uh, you can also choose an angle for n plus one eigenvalues for one special uh, self adjoint extension. 
and then by some simple perturbation argument, you see that for all the other self-returned extensions, you have at least n discrete eigenvalues. So uh, maybe you will not get the optimal angle, but um, you find an angle such that, of, of course, for a fixed tau, you have at least n discrete eigenvalues. Can be, of course, yeah? This is possible, of course, yeah? I mean, we, as I said, we have a one parametric family of self returned extensions, so actually more or less anything can happen in, with the uh, discrete spectrum. But uh, this is just some first quantitative result that you get some geometrically induced uh, discrete eigenvalues. <laughs> okay, I have a few minutes left, so I'm very happy about that. I'm not that slow as I was uh, afraid of, so I can present a few uh, ideas of the proof. And there are actually uh, many uh, different ideas coming together to finally get uh, these results. So the first thing, this is something very simple. When you consider the spectrum of the free unperturbed Dirac operator, then the thing is that this is always contained in the spectrum of any self returned realization H. This is just coming from the fact that you may choose a singular sequence for the free Dirac operator, localize it away from the interaction support, and then you have a singular sequence also for the operator H. So this is no problem. The important ingredient uh, is the following thing. Uh, we have in quadratic form, which uh, describes what this square of the underlying symmetry S is doing. Let me call it here small s of f, which is defined as the norm of s f squared. And with uh, this index R2, I mean L2 R2. And uh, this thing can be uh, written then uh, as the norm of the gradient of f squared. Of course, this is uh, only making sense in R2 without gamma, but there we have this uh, gradient, plus m squared times the norm of f squared in L2 R2, plus some term on the boundary, which uh, looks like 2m divided by tau times the uh, norm of f plus at gamma minus f minus restricted to gamma. And here we have the L2 norm on the curve gamma. And of course, this form here is defined for f in the domain of the symmetric operator S. And this is now some really important ingredient because uh, if you consider the original operator S with all these uh, Dirac matrices, that's a thing that is uh, rather difficult to uh, analyze. But here we have now something which is looking very much as the quadratic form for a Schrödinger operator with a kind of a singular potential. Of course, with a more difficult uh, domain of definition. Nevertheless, with this one can do very, very nice uh, things. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you very much, sorry. I should say that uh, this uh, formula is also not completely new. It was uh, firstly uh, found in this context, as far as I know, by Aris Habalaga, uh, Le Droist and Raymond. And uh, in the context of Dirac operators with delta potentials, I think it was in the first time contained in a paper by uh, Konstantin, Tomar, Ormia, Bonafoss, and myself. So uh, this is not completely new, but adapted to our case here. This is something which is really very, very useful. All right, so time is running, so I do not say too much about the essential spectrum. I just say that the uh, essential spectrum for all self returned realizations is uh, given by uh, these two claimed intervals. And give you a hint how you can prove this. Uh, the thing is, uh, one inclusion can be shown by some uh, estimate from above by some uh, Neumann bracketing argument. So you decompose the Euclidean space in a suitable way and find that uh, the essential spectrum must be contained in this set. And on the other hand, you can construct singular sequences uh, showing that this set here is also contained in the essential spectrum. So this is rather a standard argument. But let me explain you um, finally uh, very shortly how you can prove the existence of these discrete eigenvalues. And uh, the existence of these discrete eigenvalues is based on some uh, argument with the min-max principle and this quadratic form here above. Uh, note that you can use this quadratic form because all self-adjoint realizations are extensions of the operators S. 
So the associated quadratic forms, um, actually the quadratic forms of the squares of these operators are in a way also extensions of this quadratic form. Or in other words, if you find the right test functions for the S, then you have the right test functions for all the self-adjoint extensions. And the idea to construct these uh, self-adjoint extensions is now the following. So we need a um, capital N dimensional uh, subspace of suitable test functions. And the form of these test functions is the following. I should draw a picture first before I explain what is going on. So uh, here we have, let's say, our um, broken line. And I fix some uh, number L and have here the 2L. And I draw a strip now of width L like this. And uh, what is also going to be of importance is this uh, square, or this uh, rectangle, which is um, including everything in this uh, strip where also the uh, broken line is contained. And this distance here is denoted by 2t. All right, the idea of constructing this test function is, by the way, an idea which is borrowed by this uh, mentioned paper by Exner and uh, Niemkova, is to consider functions of the form some small n from 1 to capital N of some coefficient cn times some fn depending only on x times some g of y times some h depending on x and y. And what is now the uh, role of all these functions? The fn's of x are given as the sine of uh, 2n pi divided by l x times the characteristic function for the interval from capital L to 2 capital L of x. The function h of y is given uh, just as 1 if we are in this uh, rectangle here. So if the absolute value of y is less or equal than 2d, and it's given by some exponential function e to the power minus gamma times the absolute value of y minus 2d, if the absolute value of uh, y is larger than 2d. So the idea is it's uh, roughly speaking constant and it's exponentially uh, falling down. Uh, g, thank you very much. And the h, uh, what is the h? Uh, this is uh, some uh, now vector valued function. So, so far fn and g are only uh, scalar valued functions, so this must be a vector valued function. And let me just uh, write down what it is. It is something piecewise constant, such that uh, the function um, u will be in the domain of the s. So this is a function which is taking care that this transmission condition at the um, line here is satisfied. So now you have a candidate for the test function. You start calculating, and since my time is uh, running out, I just tell you, this is the candidate uh, which is winning. And the reason why it is so uh, is if you make the angle smaller and smaller, then the length of this um, part of the line is uh, more or less bounded from below. So this will be bounded from below. However, uh, the contribution uh, coming from everything which is outside of this uh, rectangle is becoming uh, is controlled due to this exponential term here. And um, if you make the uh, angle smaller and smaller, then everything which is inside of this rectangle is becoming very small. And if you choose now all coefficients in a good way, then it turns out that uh, this is really the right uh, test function in order to show that uh, you have at least uh, an n-dimensional subspace which fulfills our variational requirement. And I think uh, this is now a time where I should stop and thank you very much for your attention.